So we have the managing director of the Robotics Institute here, Damon Provost, who at 10.30 will activate his magical imaging device, which will cause all students in Rob 101 to instantly disappear and go into the fourth dimension. What happened once before? <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, good morning, everyone. So. Um, just want to acknowledge that I received an email saying one of the students in the class was going under a COVID-19 protocol. You guys received that uh, email as well, I assume. Everybody enrolled in the online section. We're all practicing our social distancing and mask and cleaning our areas, so I think we are fine, but um, that's always a personal choice. And anyone who is in, the in-class section can at any time go remote, okay? So we're all good with that. No hard feelings. I'll be here uh, in person. So we learned a new way to do matrix multiplication by taking the columns of the first matrix times the matching row in the second matrix. Um, I want to do one example and point out something we didn't highlight on Wednesday, it's that when you're doing these multiplications, so here's A with two columns and here's B with two rows, and so I've written down the, whoops. I mean, my camera's not on. Mike's not on? It's on here. You guys hear me better now, different? Is it? Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. <clears throat> Could have been the button was just not over far enough. Okay, so we learned a new way to do matrix multiplication as columns times rows. The standard way is the rows of A times the columns of B. So now I've taken A and B and divided them up into their columns and rows. And I want to emphasize how easy and quick it is to do this type of matrix multiplication. So the first row of the product is the first entry times that row. The second row, the second row of the product is the second entry here times this row. The third row of the product is this entry times that row. You see how quick it is to form that product? It's kind of nice. But now let's look at the other way. This column, it's this entry times the column vector. This column, this entry times the column vector. This column, this entry times the column vector. So whichever is most convenient for you, that's what you do. Okay, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. It makes it super quick to form what's called an outer product, but it's a column vector times a row vector. Four times one zero one, five times one zero one, six times one zero one. 1 times 4, 5, 6, 0 times 4, 5, 6. 1 times 4, 5, 6 is not 1, 1, 1. It's 4, 5, 6. Oh, how do I do that? OK, so um, anyway, let me fix that real quick. 4, 5, 6. <clears throat> Now I probably have my additions messed up all, all the way over here. But uh, T to be fixed, okay? So that's, that's the one thing. I'll fix that before I post the notes. That's what I wanted to emphasize was the quickness of taking this entry times this or taking this entry times this to get this row, et cetera. Cool. <clears throat> We went through um, also how we're breaking down a hard problem, AX 
AX equals B into two problems if we can factor A as a lower triangular matrix times an upper triangular matrix. So I will leave that so that we have more time to go through how do you actually factor a matrix into a lower triangular and an upper triangular. And once we do that, you can go back and review what we covered on Wednesday about how you use this, and we'll do examples in class next week as well. And the final reminder is 28 of 54 people have ordered their T-shirts so far. If you're not one of them, you're missing out, okay? So, <clears throat> okay, so let's get down to the brass tacks. I'm gonna take first a very general thing. I'm gonna write a three by three matrix. A21, A22, A23, and then A31, A32, A33, okay? Now, what are we after? If we seek L and it's lower triangular. So let's just draw the diagonal and we're gonna think of L as being columns, okay? So I'm gonna fill it in like that and it's all zeros above the diagonal. Okay, so let me just make it very graphical what we're looking for. Lower triangular, everything above the diagonal is zero. Then we want an upper triangular. And let me draw the diagonal on that. Here, we're gonna be building it by rows and then everything here is zero. And these cannot just be any arbitrary lower triangular and upper triangular. We want them to be such that our matrix A is the matrix product of the lower triangular times the upper triangular. So the question is, can we construct such matrices in a systematic way? And I hope you're gonna be amazed at how easy it is, but we'll see. Okay, online, you got the problem. It's a, it's a hard one, and mostly graduate students learn this, okay? You ready? Everybody feeling like they're a grad student today? <laughs> Maybe not. You are going to learn something that most graduate students, even on campus, would wish they knew better. So here's our first observation. And this observation is a key that unlocks the puzzle of how you factor the matrix. So we're gonna define a row vector, R, okay? And it's going to be the first row of A. So we're just gonna copy that down. A11, A12, A13. Okay, row vector. This is going to be my first row in my upper triangular matrix. That's what I'm gonna get. Now, notice that if I'm gonna get eventually a second row, it needs to have a zero in that first entry and then, then slide over. And then the next one down needs two zeros and you slide over and that's how that's going to be upper triangular. 
How can that possibly happen? I don't know. And then we're going to define C to be the first column of A, but properly scaled. So we're just going to copy down the first column. So that'll be A11, A21, and A22. And then I'm going to scale this thing by dividing by A11. Excuse me? A31. Did I not what that says? Yeah. A11, A21, A31. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So we got the first row and the first column. And the only thing we're changing in the column is we're going to normalize by this first uh, entry that's common to the row and the common common to the row in the column, and you'll see why in just a second. Now, if we're dividing by that entry, what's fundamentally our assumption here? That we're not dividing by zero, okay? So that'll be a test that we'll have to put in our algorithm. And those of you who read through some of the material that we haven't emphasized in lecture yet about swapping rows and permutation matrices. That's where that comes in to avoid the dividing by zero. But we'll go through that next week. OK, so there's our row matrix and our column matrix. Now I want to form the product column times row. OK, so let me write the column as 1. A21 divided by A11, and A31 divided by A11. And then put the row here. I'm just copying. And I seem to be better at copying my indices correctly in rows than I am in columns today. I'm in row mode. OK, now let's just do the product. And you guys saw how easy it is to multiply column vectors times row vectors. So my guess is you're going to write this down more quickly than I am. OK, so we're going to multiply these two matrices. And so I'm going to talk us through it slowly. But the first row is 1 times R. So it's A11. A12, A13. Now, for a reason that you'll understand in just a second, I'm going to fill in the column instead of going through all of the rows. So I will simply take A11 and multiply it by every entry here. OK, so that's just going to recover. A11 times 1 is A11. We already have that. A11 times A21 divided by A11 gets me my A21 back. And A11 times A31 divided by A11 gets me my A31 back. Now, I haven't filled these others in. And I'm going to put in a common symbol that means that means don't care. I mean, I do care. I need the numbers. But in some sense, I don't care. And you'll see. OK, this is all very mysterious for the moment. And now we're going to do m, excuse me, that was called a, minus c times r. And we don't have to go back up because this was A11, A12, A13, A21, A22, A23, A31, A32. And there's no minus yet. I'm getting ahead of myself. A33. So that's A.
And then I'm going to put in C times R. A11, A12, A13, A21, A31, my famous don't cares. Okay, so now we've got something magic that's just happened. We started with this general three by three matrix. We formed a column vector normalized by its first entry. We formed a row vector, all those just picking off the first row of A, the first column of A, and then normalizing it. And then when we formed the product, we have reproduced perfectly the first row of A and the first column, so that when we do the difference here, we get zero, 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 zero. <laughs> then we get stuff, okay? And that's two by two. So let's look at this structure. Okay, so what's magical about what we've just done? Can anybody have an idea, comments? Online, somebody's got a good idea about what's so special about taking A and getting a column vector and a row vector such that when we take the difference, we've got zeros on the first row and the first column and a two by two matrix left over. Okay, we can repeat the same process on this two by two matrix. Okay, when we do that, and we pick off the rows and columns, we're gonna get a zero here. We're gonna get a zero here, and then we'll end up with a one here when we normalize. And when we stack them up, that zero is gonna help us build this lower triangular matrix. And the zero here is going to be building this upper triangular matrix. And this process that goes from three by three to two by two can then be repeated on the one by one, and then we will be done. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this as an algorithm now and just go through a three by three matrix with real numbers, and we will build up our lower triangular matrix. So just here, what we would have done is C divided by C of one is our first column of L. And then for our upper triangular matrix, we put in R. So this was one by three, three by one, A minus LU went to something that is almost two by two because it's zeros around a two by two matrix and then we repeat the process and we get zeros around a one by one matrix, repeat the process, it's done. So it converges in three steps. That's an algorithm. So when you go back and listen to all of this in the lecture, second time through, it'll all be good. Okay. So we're going to do the LU factorization
of, I'm going to call it M this time, like it is in the notes, and it's minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, minus 4, 1, 11, minus 6, minus 4, minus 4. I'm going to initialize my algorithm. So I'm going to pretend I'm programming in Julia almost. OK, so I'm going to say temp equals copy of M. I'm going to set L equal to an empty matrix. Then I'm going to add columns to it. And I'm going to set R equals to an empty matrix. Then I'm going to, excuse me, U, LU factorization. U is an empty matrix, and we're going to add rows to it. Okay, so there's our M, and so K equals 1. We're going to let C equal to the first column of M, which is all negative 2. I'm going to introduce a term called a pivot, and that's going to be C of k, which for us is C of 1, and that's just minus 2. So if we're doing our algorithm, this is where we go if pivot equals 0, bail, because we don't want to divide by 0, okay? We just do a simple test. If pivot equals 0, bail, or if pivot is super small, like 10 to the minus 12, you might bail anyway, okay? So now I'm going to now define, just like we can do in Julia, C equals C times 1 over pivot. And in this case, we get something super easy here, but hey, it doesn't really matter in Julia. All we know in Julia is as long as we check that we're not dividing by 0, we divide by that number. That one's 1 for sure, and in general, those are not 1s, okay? But they happen to be in this special case. That's all. Okay? And then we set R equal to the first row of that matrix. And that's minus 2, minus 4, minus 6. So R is minus 2. A little more space there, minus 4, minus 6. <laughs> okay, so we just use the first row and the first column of A, and we build what is going to be the first column and the first row of our lower and upper triangular matrices. But to proceed, we need to see what's left over when we subtract these from our, our original matrix. So now we're going to form, going to update temp, and it's going to be equal to temp minus C times R. Okay, so I'll try to write temp neatly minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, minus 4, 1, 11 minus 6, minus 4, minus 4. I'm going to copy in C, 1, 1. Copy in R, and that was minus 2, minus 4, minus 6. <laughs> Make 
that more clear while you're catching up on your writing. To save me doing another copy, let's just do the, this product and we'll do it completely. Everybody's done, you've already beat me to it, okay? Because we take one and we multiply it by the first row, and then we take one and we multiply it by the first row, and then we take one and we multiply it by the first row, okay? So you guys already beat me to it. Minus two, minus four, minus six. Minus two, minus four, minus six. Minus two, minus four, minus six. Okay, and then can I update temp here? Well, this is designed to wipe out this row and this column, and indeed, those match and those match. It's magical. Okay, zero, 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 zero. Now this time I do care because I actually want to carry out the next step of the algorithm. I want to get the numbers, okay? But in, you know, doing these things by hand, it's a little bit painful and let's make sure that um, I don't mess up the arithmetic. <clears throat> so we've got to do one minus a minus four, so that should be five. We've got to do minus four minus a minus six. So that means minus four plus six, so that's two. We have 11 minus a minus four, so that gives us 15, and minus four minus a minus six again, that gives us two. So there's our matrix. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is define L is equal to L, and then I put C here. Because L was empty, when I append C, all I get is a matrix with a column, and it was one, one, one. And then U, is the empty matrix U, and I'll use Julia notation, and I put R, and so all I get was R, and that was minus two, minus four, minus six. Okay. I need to do these next few pages a little bit quicker, but let's see how that goes. Step K equals two. So here's, that's what temp is right now. We're going to define then C is now we take the second column, 0, 5, 15, and we divide by C of K. Whoops, excuse me. Let's do it more clearly. We define pivot equals C of K equals C of two equals five. And then we redefine C to be C times one over pivot. Then that would give us zero, we get the one, and then we get a three. Kind of see the pattern, we just keep taking columns and rows. This is temp. So what is the next value of R? It's the second row of temp, so it's 0, 5, 2. And then we do temp minus C times 
times r. So we need to copy that zero 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 five two zero fifteen two. C is zero one three. R is zero five two. That's not a six, that's a zero. Let's do this and we'll stop shortly after this. <clears throat> What's this product? Zero times the first row, zero, zero, zero. One times the row, zero, five, two. Three times the row, zero, fifteen, six. Okay, when we do this minus this, we get zeros. When we do this minus this, we get zeros. And so this whole thing, once we do the, we get zero, 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 zero. And we have two minus six, we're down to minus four. Okay, so just to be more clear, this would have zero, zero, zero. Zero five two zero fifteen two minus. Okay, so we'll finish this up on Monday, and then we will um, we will do another example and then solve a linear system which seems to be complicated and break it down into uh, forward substitution and back substitution, and then you guys will have mastered LU. But it's a very straightforward algorithm once you've done it a few times. So look through it over the weekend and we'll be good. Did you catch a mistake in my arithmetic, Sasha? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, Damon. So we want to, you guys have project one. We want to um, transition to that. And so Damon, I'm gonna, I'm gonna undo my HDMI. The, the shared screen is gonna go blank. It's coming over. They've got the cord ending here, Damon, okay. naturally. So you just need to bring your docking station. I've got this. You pick up half the stuff that's falling on the floor. Your HDMI port is, that's data port. Those are data port. Where's your HDMI? This one, no, not. You don't have an HDMI port, Damon. Do you have a C, oh, so you have a C, so I think we're good. No, you don't have a C connector either. Oh, you've got that? What is that? Oh, that's a C as well. That's the C Yeah. Um, but dum dum dum. This is why Ed Krauss rules. That's right. <laughs> uh. Yeah, so you need HDMI to data port, which is kind of strange here. Those are USBs. They're all my USBs. And this is the mini display port. The mini display port yeah. Do not have. Okay. So we can we can kind of punt a little bit. I know it's it, unless you want to go and I can run and try to find one real quick. Do um, you got one in your office? I think there might be one there. Yeah, why don't you do that, and then I'll talk about other aspects of the project. So I'm going to plug back in, and we we will do the demo and. Okay, let's see if the screen share needs to be reinitiated. No, it's there. 
So project number one. What's the mathematical underpinning? So this, was, this project was built by Tribby and, and, uh, and Mani. So we, we, we tend to like to put coordinates on things so we can say, give it an x, y position, for example. So I'm going to work in the plane for now and not 3D. We know the world is 3D that we're, we're walking around in, and we're going to do a 3D LiDAR demo, I promise. But, okay, so let's say we have um, this birdhouse, whatever it is, barn, I don't know, okay? It has a location in the XY uh, plane, and it's got X, X coordinate and Y coordinate, so X, C, Y, C. The thing is, we're using this LIDAR, the demo that we just did, right? Okay, the one that you, we, we will be doing. We have the LIDAR, and it's mounted on the top of Cassie's head. And Cassie um, is at some point in space. So she's walking around on the North Campus quad. And let's just suppose that Cassie is at position TX, TY in our global coordinate system, the one that we use to measure the position of buildings on the North Quad. You know, I went out there and I put in my stake and we did an XY axis there. Cool. So, the thing is, Cassie measures the object, though, in her coordinate system. That's all she has. Cassie doesn't know the other thing. She's got a sensor on the top of her head. Those beams are going out, and we're measuring the distance away, but it's with respect to the LIDAR sitting on, on uh, Cassie's head. So the challenge is to take the measurements that are in the coordinate system that is Cassie's, and turn that into the coordinates that are in the world frame, because we want to take each of these images and overlay them so that they're in a common set of coordinates. So this is pretty easy. Cassie measures the object as being at x prime, y prime. Cassie is at tx, ty, and so we can calculate what is the true position of the object in the coordinate system by just translating by where Cassie is. So translation, I think everybody can kind of get. You take one vector, you offset it by another, and like, why am I beating on this? It's such an a, a obvious thing, perhaps, but that's what's going on. So we have to transform the measurements taken by the LIDAR sensor. So there's Cassie with her LIDAR on her, okay, sitting on top of her head. But what gets more interesting is, you know, Cassie doesn't just walk like on her checkerboard, she turns. So now Cassie's measuring like this, and Cassie reports the position of the birdhouse as being at X prime and Y prime. How do we transform that back into coordinates that we understand? Because we want them in our map coordinates. Because if we just keep taking Cassie's data, and we overlay this view of the world with even Cassie's view when she ha wasn't turned and positioned, there's going to be objects everywhere, okay? So in the first image, the house is at X prime, Y prime there, but now look at how much the X coordinate has changed due to the rotation and the Y coordinate, and you're going to see another copy of that object at the wrong location. So you've got to transform it to the right coordinates. And so Cassie now sees the object at x prime, y prime. If we know the relative turn Cassie has made, there's, you can use trigonometry to figure out what is the coordinate transformation. And that's called a rotation matrix. So in 2D, rotation matrices look like cosine, cosine, minus sine, sine. Rotation matrices look like cosine, cosine, minus sine, sine. And theta is this angle that you've rotated Cassie's coordinate system. The problem you have, though, is that Cassie both walks and rotates, and you have to keep track of her translation and her rotation, and that's what we teach you how to do. And Cassie's measuring things in 3D, not in 2D, so we first take you through everything in 2D so you get used to the manipulations. 
And then you're going to be stunned that everything that kind of was digestible in 2D, is you'll be done with the third part when you work on the LIDAR data like that. You're going to go like, what happened? And it's the power of vectors and matrices, OK? That's what happens. You're going to be underwhelmed almost when you get to the final part about how easy it is once you master those skills in 2D. So I'm warning you, OK? But when you see the final GIF, you're going to generate a short video in the form of a GIF file. You will have a robot walking in a map that all the images are localized and are registered, one says, into a world frame. So it's just awesome, OK? And how many megabytes of data are they using? Almost 200. 200 megabytes of data, OK. We cut it down from a gigabyte just so that IllumiDesk doesn't go crazy with 54 students all crunching a megabyte at the same time on their servers, OK? So Damon. What do we got? We got more connectors now? We've got more connectors, we've got more wires. More wires. More robotics. It's like matrices, <laughs> if, all the, if only the world were just matrices and vectors, it would just be so much easier. So now, students, I'm disconnecting again. Damon and I are going to make the connection. Make the connection. Magic works. All right. OK, you got to share a different screen than the one you're on there. Ooh, let's turn out all the lights in this room. Actually, before you do that, I yeah. want to I, I take a look at this as it is, right? So you can kind of see everyone. Wave your hands. Everyone wave your hands a little bit. Find yourself on the, uh, the LiDAR, right? So what is a LiDAR? What, what are we looking at here? The, the simple thing, we started with like a range finder. This is like a, like a little laser pointer. If you stand over here, the students online can maybe oh. see you better. And I'll stand over there. Perfect. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, so, hey, yeah, so like there's me. Ha <laughs> ha. There's me. <laughs> so look at the shadow. What's the shadow that Jackie's casting on the wall there? It's a, it's a giant pressure grizzle on the shadow. Ooh. And I can go and I can cover up this entire sensor and I can block out everything. So if you're driving down the road and you know, get some mud on your sensor, all of a sudden, and Cassie or your car, uh, that's not a very good thing. Oh. Oh. That makes sense. <laughs> Damon, start all over again. Sure thing. All right. I'll just uh, hold like this. OK, that's great. Uh, yeah, so, so a LIDAR is a range finder. So there's a laser in there. So if you think of a laser pointer that shoots out, you know the speed of light, and you know how long it's going to take. You can measure it how long once it reflects and comes back. So there is a sensor in there that measures that IR beam that goes out. Now, they started out with just you know finding the distance. You don't want to run into a wall, or you want to figure out you know if you're a golfer, how far the, the tee is from where you're, you're shooting so you, have a, you, know, you pick the right club. Uh, for robotics, they said, well, it only gives you that one little thing. So what happens if we start spinning it? So inside this LIDAR, there's a, a wheel that just spins the, the laser around. And they're like, well, what if we put more lasers on? So this one actually has 16 lasers that are shooting out. And you can kind of see all these different beams. If you count them all, there's 16 different beams that are going out, which kind of interesting about it is when you're really close. So if you're in the front row, the slider can see you pretty well. You can start making out features, you know, shoulders, heads. As you get farther away, these beams spread out. And if you look at that back wall, like it's really non-dense. Um, it's an active sensor. So one of the things that's interesting about it now, so you know, it's daytime, you're driving, or Cassie's walking, it, it works fine. But at nighttime, if we shut off the lights, if you want to hit the lights, Jesse, let's yeah. look at the image and see what happens. Nothing. So the great thing about an active sensor, whether it's daytime or nighttime, you're providing your own uh, laser, so it doesn't affect your, uh, the data that's coming back. So if you have just a camera, you're relying on the sun as being that uh, transmitter of, of energy here, but we bring our own transmitter here with our LiDAR. Um, I'll break. We'll pass this. So Cassie's uh, sensor you're getting has 32 beams. Damon is working with another professor and theirs has 128 beams, OK? So yeah, there's some really awesome sensors. And then the more beams, it's sort of like having more pixels in your camera image. So go back and look at digital images from 10 years ago. And now look at what you're getting on your cell phones. Just tremendous difference in the quality of the images. And that's what we're seeing in LiDAR technology for the same cost 
of this 16 beam, you can easily get 64 beams now. And then 128 is still expensive, but it gives an amazing resolution. The other thing that's coming down the road is solid state. So right now, you know, there's this big spending part in there that that's not very good for reliability long term. It uses more energy. So if you could just have like that that little CCD that's in the back of your camera that's doing the, the same sort of thing, we can shoot out the, the different laser beams at the different angles and then measure them without spinning. Um, our old ones, uh, they actually, the packaging was different. So the, the, you know, if you ever see some of the cars that are driving around still with, you know, sensors that are four years old, they're spinning around a lot, which is, again, not good for reliability for, for cars, for planes, or for anything else. So they're getting smaller. They're getting uh, more densely packaged here. So the students online can't see the sensor yeah. where it is. The camera is Where's my camera? way back there. Oh, there we go. So I'll show it up here. And actually, so when, when we're thinking about this, too, so we're talking about reference frames. And so this is measuring from an origin that is very well known inside the sensor. So when you're doing it with your, uh, your vehicle or your robot, you're going to mount it onto a, a specific part on that robot. And as that moves, you need to know how that robot is moving relative to here because um, you can see on some old videos of Cassie, if I'm walking back and forth, this is kind of what my world looks like. Uh, so understanding whether I'm on you know, this side of the car or that side of the car, or if I turn uh, 90 degrees there, I get different angles. But if you learn your matrix rotations, then it's really easy just to put it back in the coordinate frames that are useful to you. Cool. Yeah. So I think this is super cool. So watch all the rotations. The sensor has its own coordinate frame. Look at the image that's on the screen. The world is not changing. It's just the perception of the world by the sensor. So I have this thing tilted over. Excuse me. What's The world hasn't changed. It's the sensor's position that has changed. This image needs to be rotated roughly 45 degrees to bring it back into the world frame. Now it's turned. Have you moved in the classroom? <laughs> But your position on the screen has changed, so you must have moved, right? I have proof that you moved. Look. Look what's on the screen. I can prove you moved. I can prove you're not even here, OK? You didn't attend class today. OK, so this is the thing we mean about there is a coordinate system in the sensor. And then you need to take that information, what is the position and orientation of the sensor, to take the image back to a common coordinate system so that each image is registered into a, a coordinate system that we would agree upon for the room, where we put x along here and y out there, for example. That's what we would have to do. Now, on Cassie and on the cars, there's a sensor called an inertial measurement unit, or IMU for short. It measures acceleration in x, y, and z, and it measures angular rate about each of those axes. You can imagine rotating about the x-axis, rotating about a y-axis, and rotating about the z-axis. Those are called gyroscopes. They measure angular rates. You take that information and a really powerful algorithm called an extended Kalman filter, and you can estimate in real time the position change of this object and the rotation, the orientation. So position and orientation gives you something called the pose of the robot. And with all that information together, you can take this and transform it back into this. Okay, And that's what your project is all about. On Cassie, it's done in real time at 10 hertz. OK. You guys, I don't know. It's going to take you 10 minutes for each, each uh, LiDAR scan that's not real time. I don't know how fast you'll do it, OK? We'll see. But that's your, that's your mission, if you accept it, is to register all of the LiDAR images into a common frame. I need to let Damon go. He's got a meeting that starts precisely at 11. But I can answer a few more questions if people would have the desire to pose questions. So are these beams at different angles or just different heights? OK, so the question is, are we seeing at different angles or at different heights? Uh, the beams. Are they at different oh, the beams. Yeah. OK. So 
Um, Damon, you can go ahead and pack up, and we'll just pretend my head is the uh, LiDAR sensor <laughs> since it's sitting on the top of, uh, of Cassie. The beams are going out at, on Cassie, 32 different angles. There's one that goes out exactly on the plane and rotates. There's one that's, wrote, that's angled up about a degree, and then the next one, one more degree, and the next one, one more degree, up to about 16 degrees, and then similarly, after the middle, one is going down a degree, down a degree, down a degree, down a degree, and that gives you like a 33 degree spread that you're scanning as the beams rotate around in a circle. So that's the, that's the um, field of view of the sensor. Did I get that answered? Yes, Sasha. You have to speak louder through your mask. Is there a reason the, they're always in groups of 16? Oh, um, I don't know why they make them in powers of two, OK? I really do not. I mean, it could be 17 beams. It really wouldn't change anything. Maybe for marketing, it's like gas at 399 instead of 401, you know? I don't know. Damon, you have an opinion? <laughs> it's probably some scaling thing, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a, I'm not sure why. Yeah, nobody knows why. We'll have to ask Velodyne next time they're, they're here, okay? But, um, yeah, she's playing stump the chump, and she stumped the chumps, okay? 